Fantastic. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you to our panelists, uh, Tiffany, Catherine, Brianna, and Jamie. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. I know that I speak on behalf of not just Kali, but our very eager sophomores uh, when I say that we are super excited to hear from you, to learn from your experiences, um, and just you know, really put into action the advice that you may have to offer. Um, for all the students that are listening and welcome, this is the final and best event of our recruiting ramp up series, in my opinion, Women on Wall Street. Um, so this evening we'll spend the next 30 to 45 minutes um, just uh, asking some questions, right, to these four wonderful women about their experiences in finance, how they've navigated their careers. And then we'll open up the last quarter of the panel for you to be able to ask your questions. So feel free to send those questions to the panelists or to me in the chat. And then at the end of our uh, discussion, we'll get to that. Um, so yeah, why don't we do a quick round of introductions, uh, perhaps your name, uh, the firm that you work for, um, the year and the uh, school that you graduated from Georgetown um, and a fun fact. So Tiffany, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, my name is Tiffany Robinson. And as you can tell from my background, I am currently with KBW, that's Keith, Bria, and Woods. I'm Georgetown MSB class of 2010. And a fun fact about me, um, back in high school, I ran, I was in the Miss Teen DC pageant the same year I was president of the robotics club. That's very fun. <laughs> uh, oh, great. Um, how about Catherine, do you want to go next and then we can go Jamie and then Brianna, it's just a circle on my screen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wish I could see all of you uh, or, or do this in person, um, but lovely to meet you uh, on Zoom. Uh, my name is Catherine Ladd. I work at Morgan Stanley. I sit in the Institutional uh, Equity Division, um, which is Equity Sales and Trading. Um, I uh, am Georgetown MSB class of 2014. Um, don't have any fun facts that are even similar to that. Um, Love that whole pageant and robotics. Uh, I've never ventured in robotics, but I find the whole thing fascinating. Um, and I might need to come back to the to the fun question. That is one thing I did not prepare, but please ask me again. I will come up with something. <laughs> Definitely. I'll remember to ask you again. Hey, everyone. My name is Jamie Woodard. I'm currently in my room in Brooklyn, New York. I work at Bank of America within Debt Capital Markets. So I'm a second year associate. I graduated from the MSB in 2017. And my fun fact, let's see. Ooh, my senior year at Georgetown, I got to go to an event where I met Justice Sotomayor, which was really fun. And she promised me she'd send me a book and she actually found my Georgetown address and sent it to me. So perks of being in DC. Major props. I, that's amazing that she like followed through. That's like, how I great know. is that? Oh I my know. gosh, it's awesome. <laughs> Love that. Love the fun facts. Mine's definitely going to be lame by comparison. Um, but I'm Brianna Creighton. I graduated from Georgetown in 2018. I'm a senior analyst at Citi. I'm in the equity capital markets group. Um, at Georgetown, I was in the college. I was a political economy major. And my fun fact, I was planning to make it a little bit more relatable to Georgetown students, I guess, because I'm clearly not that cool. Um, but I was on the board of GUSIF. That was by far my biggest extracurricular commitment at Georgetown. I think all of those are plenty fun facts. I love it. Um, and to your point, Jamie, with uh, Justice Sotomayor, fantastic. I'm like really hoping that uh, second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, makes an appearance somewhere in Georgetown. And once everything goes back to normal, that we'll see him in person. Like, I just want to smother him with all the questions about our Madam Vice President. Um, he seems fantastic. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so welcome everyone. I'm so glad that uh, we're doing this. And I guess my first question is, um, what led you to pursue a career in finance? You know, and in explaining that, maybe you can also explain, you know, what made you choose your firm over the many, many others in the industry? Um, Brianna, do you want to start? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so candidly, I never thought I would end up working in finance. 
Um, I am the product of two lawyers and growing up, I loved reading and writing and it kind of felt like it was just the natural conclusion that I would be a lawyer too. Um, and then up in, that was basically the foregone conclusion up until my freshman year of college. Um, and I was in this really interesting finance mentorship program that summer that I still keep in touch with the head of that program. And I often joke with him that I have no idea why he chose me. Um, nothing on my resume indicated that I would have been interested in finance, but I casually liked talking about stocks with my dad. It was something that the two of us kind of bonded over, talked about that in the interview with him and honestly, black magic lucked into the program. And from there, I kind of realized that it fit a lot of the things that I wanted in a career. It's fast paced. It's challenging. Um, I didn't have to wait three years to go to law school to do it. Um, and sort of after that first summer, which was really aimed towards liberal arts students to help build a foundation in finance. I mean, the, the learning curve going into finance is so steep. And basically the goal of the director was to make it a, approachable sort of to students who weren't necessarily in finance backgrounds. And so once I felt schooled, I felt confident in recruiting and luckily Georgetown makes that so, so easy. So re recruited as a sophomore, interned at City as a sophomore, um, came back as a junior, came back full time and kind of have been here ever since. So definitely not necessarily where I ended up thinking I would be, but I, I really have been so happy with my choice and do you see myself kind of sticking the path and probably not going to law school anymore. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I love that. And also you are, you know, rep, you are the uh, rep for the college and, you know, the only non-MSB school on this panel. So I love it. Um, Catherine, how about you? How did your, you know, Georgetown experiences and just your interests and passions lead you into finance? Yeah. So I guess um, my fun fact could be in high school, I, I always wanted to go into medicine. I was totally obsessed with Grey's Anatomy. I was like, this is going to be me. I'm going to be Patrick Dempsey, like, this is great. Um, then kind of realized um, I loved my like AP bio class, but it was just so much about plants. And I was like, no, this is too boring. I need instant satisfaction. Uh, and I had been exposed to the finance industry just through my family, both my siblings, when they graduated school, had gone into it. So it had just kind of been part of the as boring as it sounds, like the dinner conversation. And so I was a little bit exposed to it. And I think when I was then applying to schools and, and Georgetown, you do have to apply to a specific school. It just kind of felt like a natural, uh, like I was just kind of gravitated towards the business school. Um, and once I was there and just the the friends I made from, from class and also just the teachers really exposing you to all the networking events and all of the career opportunities, it just kind of felt very natural for me. And I, I know that's probably not the best answer for anyone that doesn't know if they want to do it, but um, I, I would just say, at least being in, in the business school and having exposure from my family, it was not as scary uh, to kind of go that path because I had had exposure to it. Definitely. It's, it's funny how those conversations with family or just in other realms of your life really can impact how that journey progresses, you know. Um, Tiffany, how about you from, you know, potential Miss Teen DC and robotics president all the way to, you know, where you are at KBW? What did that look like? Sure. So um, actually, I came from a family of entrepreneurs. So it was always my thought I would go into business. And the funny thing is I actually had to convince my mom to like get on board with the idea. Um, I remember in high school, she's telling me, you don't have to major in business to do business. And I told her, I know this is what I want to do. So I actually started off um, focusing on international business and poli sci. And about my sophomore year, I, I decided to focus solely on finance. Um, Cause I actually had a really great professor, Professor George Comer. Um, he kind of gave me the nudge to, to look into investment banking. And then I tell people the way I got into finance really is I'm a numbers nerd. So like the classes I really enjoyed at Georgetown was my corporate finance class, my, um, believe it or not, my business statistics class, and then somehow time out all together through management science. I remember that was a struggle. Um, so I was, you know, like I said, I'm a numbers nerd. I thought it was great how I could build predictive models and value companies. 
Um, but then when you actually get on the desk, you have other software for that. Like we use FactSet and S&P Global. So I'm not actually doing the predicting anymore, but um, it's cool to know I could if I wanted to. Um, and as far as where I am today, so I actually started at Barclays. So I've always been a fig banker. Um, but I actually started at Barclays. I was an MBA associate and I was there for, I interned there. I worked there for about three years and then I transferred to KBW. And the reason I did that was that particular, even though Barclays is a great bank for the area I was focused on for my industry, there wasn't a lot of M&A activity. It was a lot of capital markets. And so, you know, wanting to kind of be like an expert in my field and get more exposure, um, I made the transition because, and most people wouldn't know this because it's such, such a niche area, but like KBW, even though it's considered a boutique investment bank is actually like always number one, number two in bank M&A. So that's why I made the transition um, just because, you know, if I wanted to be serious about my particular industry, I needed to go to the bank that had the most exposure and um, it's worked out really well. Definitely. That's so great That's to so hear. Great to hear. Um, so then Jamie, for you, what did it look like for you to feel like you wanted to pursue a career in finance? What made you choose Bank of America over right so many of the other firms in the industry? Yeah. So my answer might be a little different. So I just remember as a sophomore, there's this like immense pressure to be passionate about something professionally. And I just never felt that way, at least at that age. And it's funny because with these questions, I have my view in hindsight and my view of how I felt at the time. And I think when I was applying to this capital markets program at B of A, I was 19 years old. And I just saw that it was going to be challenging. And Brianna, I believe mentioned fast paced. And I was like, all right, that sounds fun enough. Let me apply to it. And luckily they accepted me. But then what happens is when you're there, you have this whole different perspective about what you really want. Um, there's this woman, Carla Harris, she's this vice chairman at Morgan Stanley, Catherine's nodding. And in one of her books, which I recommend you all read, Expect to Win and Strategize to Win, she talks about relationship currency and performance currency. And relationship currency is about like who's going to sponsor you for the move after you're an analyst or like who's going to really take the time to develop you and put you in front of clients. And that's how my managers are and were at Bank of America. And that's why I've stayed. And that's why I chose to go back for a junior summer and work there full time. So admittedly, the roles that we're all doing aren't all that different at the big banks but you should really think about like where you fit, where you're comfortable and where you think someone's really gonna take the time to develop you as a professional. So sure, you might not know that till you get there, but I think that's the key reason of why we've all stayed where we are. Thank you, Jamie. That's a wonderful, wonderful point. And um, I guess I'll also pose the question to everyone else. What did it look like for you all to be able to find advocates uh, and or mentors within your firm? Was that an easy process? Was it um, was there already, you know, programs and things set in place or was that something you actively pursued? Um, whoever would like to start. I can go ahead and, and start just yeah. briefly. Mm -hmm. I think when you start, when you're an intern, especially if you're a female intern or if you're diverse in other ways, there are going to be a lot of formal mentorship programs. And to be transparent, sometimes these get really tiring because you have to participate and full-time even it's sort of the same thing. But the beauty of that is that you do end up meeting a bunch of different people and eventually you will click with someone, whether that person is male or female, whether they're actually in your direct group or not. But a lot of it is just figuring out like what, who you look up to in a professional way or who you get along with and then taking the time to like develop that relationship, which really doesn't take too much. It could be just coffee once a month, but just being honest with yourself. Like if the most senior person in you don't have that, then don't try and force it for that person to be your mentor. Like one of my greatest mentors at work is two years above me as an associate, but just thinking about that in a sense. Yeah, I'd also add, um, 
you know, during the programs uh, through internships, there is so many different mentorship programs and you're really, um, in some cases, you're just directly assigned a mentor. In other cases, there may be like a speed dating type event and then you get matched. Um, but I'd also like to add like, and I'm sure I, I know I speak for Morgan Stanley, but I'm sure at Bank of America and City and others, there is a massive Georgetown network at a lot of these banks too that are just a natural um, network that you sh will have access to. And I think even if there isn't someone directly in your division, like I just, the Georgetown network that at least I found is such a family that I've, no one's ever turned down a coffee or turned down a meeting. Um, and I would say just regardless of where you end up, see if there's like a Georgetown mail group that you can join because that'll naturally just be an amazing network that you can use. Absolutely. Um, and that's a really great point, Catherine, that I would love to build off of. And yes, right, like Georgetown is, is has been such a place of opportunity from the time that I've been here. You know, the partnerships that we have with all these wonderful, wonderful firms in the industry. And I think it's the kind of opportunity where students can really figure out what is the best match for them, right, when it comes to firm culture and whatnot. And I guess uh, my question next for all of you would be, um, as you all know, networking is a part of this recruiting process, right? And I'm just wondering, now that you've been on both sides, how would you recommend students go about networking and activating that Georgetown network as they're going through this process this semester? Um, how about Brianna, would you like to start? Sure, definitely. I think absolutely agree with everything that's been said about the Georgetown network being so important. First of all, I'd like to begin with that. I think we joke that the city lobby is like the MSB Commons. Like you cannot walk through there and not see someone from Georgetown. It's so, so funny. Um, and it's a great way, I think, to ease the transition into being a working person to know that you have so many people from your class who or even classes above you that you can casually grab coffee with and make life feel a little bit more like you used to. So super comforting um, and has been such a great part of kind of my experience at City and I know it is at the other firms as well. Um, in terms of networking, I think that my biggest takeaway has always been quality over quantity and that's probably cliched, but I really do believe it. Um, it's so much better to have one person who you really hit it off with and you have a ongoing relationship with um, who is so much more likely to vouch for you as opposed to you know 10 people who maybe talk to you one time and don't necessarily know exactly how invested you are or too too much about you um, because at the end of the day I think it always comes down to who did you really leave an impression on and how willing are they to go to bat for you and even if that's one person but they're you know willing to go to the ends of the earth with you it's so much more important than you know, tangentially knowing a few people. Definitely. I think that's such a great point, Brianna. I always stress to the students, like exactly what you said, it's better if you have like one to two people who are like your fierce cheerleaders versus like eight to nine people who may only feel like lukewarm, right? So absolutely fantastic point. Tiffany, um, I saw that you unmuted. Uh, I was just wondering, yeah, what are your thoughts about, you know, being on both sides of networking and navigating that? I would second everything that Brianna has just said, that you want to be very genuine in your connections. So now I've having been on both sides, and I'm really active in recruiting both when I was at Barclays and at KBW, you want to be, when you have these conversations, come prepared, and, you know, you should make them meaningful, because, you know, it's, it's kind of like you have a handbook to investment banking, like the recruitment process is very by the book. So, you know, you should ask substantive questions, not just things that you could go Google. Um, and so I think that's important to be prepared. Um, and then also, you said, make a good impression. Um, I've had students who, you know, might have kind of fumbled through the first half of their um, behavioral questions, but when it came to the technicals or vice versa, but I could tell that like, okay, you really know what you're talking about. Or, you know, I can tell you have like a real interest here and it makes me want to like talk to you more. Um, you know, as so I think be thoughtful and be um, mindful of the conversations you're having. And then also like another thing I would um, kind of warn against is 
there's been times I've had conversations with students and you ask them the typical why banking question and they actually end up talking themselves out of banking. They What they end up describing to me is, is uh, consulting or asset management, but like what they, you know, they're very passionate and they have this, um, you know, really good story, but I'm like, oh, that's not at all what we do. Or that's what you're so passionate about. I should hand you off to my colleague and like in capital markets or in research. Um, so that's another thing I would say is just, again, being prepared for your conversations. Um, so you know what you want to get out of it and what you want to convey. Definitely. Super great point, Tiffany. Um, it is funny, the idea that, yeah, I think sometimes students have this idea of what finance is. And then once they are participating in that, those networking calls and whatnot, and being able to hear from people like you, right, like who have these experiences talking about their day in the life and things like that, they really do get a feel for like, great, like this is what I would like out of a finance career with division, right? The kinds of responsibilities or uh, the kinds of deals I would want to work on, so on and so forth. So excellent, excellent point. And also that's, a you know, again, using the network, you should see your Georgetown network as a safe space. And, you know, if you don't know, or you don't have a clear understanding, you can have those soft conversations with us. You can have those coffee chats with us because we'll prepare you before you get in front of the actual interviewers. Um, so like I said, you, it's a safe space to ask questions, kind of doing like a pre-call with whoever is in your network or whoever your buddy is. And then, you know, so you can just like ace your interviews. Yeah, definitely. Um, I always hear such great feedback from the students who participate in recruiting saying like, man, the Georgetown network really made a difference, right? It was the alums that would reach out to them being like, hey, do you want to run a mock interview, right? Or, hey, heard you got selected. Great. How are you feeling, right? Things like that. And I think, yeah, the um, the Hoya network is strong and thriving. And, you know, I have no reason to doubt that it will continue to do, be so, especially in this kind of industry. Um, actually, pivoting a little bit, uh, because all of you are at different points in your career, I was wondering, you know, forming relationships with colleagues and clients is really important in your line of work. Given how male heavy the industry is, I was wondering how do you navigate and participate in these relationships? I mean, I, I can, I can certainly um, jump in here. I would say like one thing that it can be kind of hard, um, at least the first time, but you really just have to like be who you are and try not to like fit in or fit into a mold. Um, there will always be times or hopefully less often, but, um, there have definitely been times where there are just conversations happening, the kind of chit chat, just breaking up the day that you just can't participate, whether it's like very sports heavy or talking about golf or something like that. And, Luckily, I at least work um, on a floor before uh, we were all working from home with a lot of women. Um, so fortunately, uh, you know, our, I'm in a division that is very female heavy and we can at least break away and talk about other stuff and um, just kind of do the same thing in front of them. Um, we've actually like reorganized our floor plan so some of that can't happen um, where there are these little like patches of conversations um, that happen. But I would say, again, like you have to just be yourself. Um, like one example, you know, if you're out with clients and, you know, you go with one of your male colleagues and you're meeting up with men and they're, you know, clients and they're two men and everyone's ordering beer and you don't want a beer, like get a margarita, like don't try to like fit this mold. Um, and you just have to, to be yourself and be genuine. And I think that'll just start other conversations that if you're just kind of trying to fit in won't come up. Um, and that way you'll be able to, you know, participate or that's all I can say is like, you have to just try to try to be yourself and not think that you have to fit into a mold. I'll just hop in after Catherine and love what you had to say. Uh, one positive thing I'll share is especially now with all that has happened uh, with the work from home environment. I think that the, the view at least I have when I graduated from school of what it would like to be a female in finance has definitely shifted. I'll just play devil's advocate. It's, I don't really think about being a woman in finance 
often, especially as a racial minority, which I think impacts my day-to-day a lot more. But as a with the clients, a lot of what you'll realize is like, if you're smart, you're smart. If you're right, you're right. Like I've seen clients call out plenty of men on the phone instead of women, et cetera. And I've honestly experienced like difficulty bonding with both male and female clients because a lot of what we provide is numbers and you just have to get that right first (laughs) before you're truly getting along with someone. But similar to Catherine, it's just like present who you are and just make sure that you're comfortable with that. And another part as a junior person is like, do you have a manager who's also going to facilitate that you're comfortable like where you are, whether that's a male or female manager. And then another thing is I personally don't follow a lot of sports. I know a lot of women at work that do and participate in these conversations, but try and figure out a couple places where you can bond with that client or senior person in a different way. Do they have kids that are your age? Do they live in the same area that you live in where they go to college? Like there are a million different things. Like if it's, I cover consumer retail companies, I always talk about what I'm buying of theirs, but there's always some other way that you can just level with them as regular people. So I'd encourage you to also think about that. It doesn't have to be a gender thing. I would agree with that. I um, actually, the last, I think like the last five transactions I've done, my CEO or CFO of the company has been a woman. And that gave me a unique opportunity to bond with them in ways like my other colleagues didn't. Um, actually, one of um, the CFOs of the company I IPO'd, we just happened to like bump into each other in the ladies' room and had this like whole conversation and you know she's a CFO and she's only two years older than me and so we ended up having this deep conversation and all the following client meetings since then you know they just kind of ignore the senior males on my team and like just jump on the phone like hi Tiffany how's your day what's going on um so I was able to make a connection with her and then that guys that led to other conversations and so now you know kind of I guess you say like elevated me and the presence of my um, colleagues. So they like said, use, um, you know, use your, play your strengths and try to make connections with people in other ways, um, you know, be genuine. And then also I would say in terms of connecting with your, um, with your coworkers. So I'm, my group is actually very male dominated. Um, we have one female analyst and myself. Um, and there's two female senior bankers, but they're not in the New York office. So my team is pretty, my day to day is all men. And I would say, you know, if you're lucky enough, you have a group that's inclusive, but you know, it's like push pull. Um, my group was really inclusive when I first joined them. Everyone like on their own came by, introduced themselves to me. Um, you know, if they're like grabbing coffee or grabbing lunch, they'll like invite me with them. Um, but also I, kind of take that step forward. I'm someone who actually has mostly male friends. So I do jump into the conversation when it comes to football. Um, I will, you know, there's, I think there's some like Instagram accounts that we have in common. So we'll like talk about that. Um, right now we all have like the same group chat. So, you know, you, ha- you know, don't be afraid to sometimes insert yourself and be a part of the conversation. Or sometimes if you see them heading to coffee, say, hey, can I come with you? Or like, just kind of invite yourself, like, don't be afraid to do that. But, um, you know, ultimately you're going to just find what works for you, whatever style works for you that you can maintain. I think that's the path you should follow. Definitely great points, Tiffany. I love this idea of memes bringing people together. This is truly, you know, a unique time uh, in social media and just in life, right? I guess kind of along those lines, I'm wondering for all of you, could you also, you know, perhaps provide an example of a challenge that perhaps you faced as a woman in your firm um, or as right, or as like a racial minority in your firm uh, and or like just being that in the industry and how you felt you handled that successfully? Uh, I'll give it some time. I know sometimes not everyone can immediately think of it, but or an example, but if there was something that like a challenge you overcame that you're particularly proud of, something you accomplished that you were really proud of, would love to hear about that. I can start with this one. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's something that I've 
you know, one specific challenge that I've overcome. It's something that is a continual work in progress. But I think one of the best pieces of advice or kind of insights that I have gotten, there are only a few female MDs in my group. And um, one thing that our group started doing was having juniors present at Monday morning meeting, which I don't know, I'm assuming you guys probably have something similar across your groups where it's the whole group in one room at the same time, very intimidating. MDs love to brag about their own transactions. Um, and they decided juniors need more presentational experience. And so we were going to be the ones presenting deals. I think it was a great idea. We presented a deal, my associate and I, and someone asked a very off the wall follow-up question, not something that anyone with any rational amount of preparation would have known the answer to. And my associate, who's also a woman, said, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Let me come back to you. And the healthcare MD, who happens to also be a woman, grabbed us later that afternoon. She was like, you guys did a great job presenting, but let me be completely honest with you. I'm not going to tell you to ever pretend that you know more than you do or to fabricate, but I'm telling you for a fact that if a man had been asked that question, he would have given an educated guess instead of saying, I don't know. And she was basically saying, don't be afraid to wait until perfection to give an answer. She was like, there, for every one you, there are three men who are going to be much more confident about their potentially wrong answers. And they won't hesitate to give them. Um, and so I, that really resonated for me because I know I am the kind of person who will wait until complete certainty because I don't want to be wrong. And she, it was really interesting to have her so clearly say, this happens all the time. Like she was like, I hear things that other men say in this group in calls. And I'm like, that was wrong. That was wrong. That was wrong. But frankly, no one's going to call them out on it because no one knows the right answer except, you know, a few select people. And so I think, I don't know if it's a common problem amongst women. It sounds like she has noticed it over and over that we will second guess ourselves and we will wait. Um, and, you know, don't be afraid to kind of put yourself out there. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, um, this is more of just like a, a, a story or just something more about like overcoming some like biases. Uh, I know my first year um, I had worked on a huge model um, with uh, my male associate and the two of us got along great, built up this massive model, put a whole report together and we presented it to our team and another male colleague on the team um, and I, of course I was, you know, very junior. It was my first year, um, kind of, you know, looked at me and was like, wow, this is really great. Um, Catherine, did you, did you help with the formatting and the colors? And I had built out multiple, like the, it was like my proud project of this huge model. Um, and I was just furious and I didn't say anything. And like a year or two later, I mentioned the story to my manager and she was like, well, I would have said, and words that I um, am not going to repeat on this. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting. And she said, like, you have to call him out or that's going to happen again. And I'll just, you know, say a second time. Um, it was, you know, a year or two ago. Um, and it was, again, a full team meeting. We were kind of assigning responsibilities and we were putting a client um, event together. And naturally I was, you know, assigned versus a male equivalent. First time, it was like the second time. And I was kind of like, this just seems like I'm being assigned to do some of this, not administrative, because it's more than that. But again, like, why am I always being the one that's pulled in to like help with events? Um, and I called him out. And of course it was like, oh my God, it, it hadn't really occurred. It was more like, well, you've done it the last two times, just do it again. Um, but I think it's something that we have to just like as women in the industry, like call people out if you think that's happening. Um, Cause they're not gonna, like sometimes it's just not awareness. Um, and that's what's just gonna make, uh, you know, us better as a whole um, is really just sometimes you, you really do have to speak up. Um, and those are some examples where, you know, if you don't know whether or not to say anything, just speak with not, not necessarily your manager, but just a peer and just be like, would you have said something um, and, and get others' opinions because we all have to kind of be in this together. That was, Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Oh, James. go ahead. No, oh, no, go ahead, I was just gonna, oh no, no, no. I was just going to quickly say like, 
That's super awesome, Catherine. And I think just, you know, learning from the first experience and bringing that into the second experience, like kudos to you for calling them out. I'm so glad you felt comfortable enough to do that too. And knowing like you um, had, I, how do I put this? I think sometimes women think like, oh, can I say this right or whatnot? But like, I think it's awesome that you took that step to do that. And hopefully even setting a precedent for like other junior uh, female analysts who will follow in your footsteps to do that too, you know, like, especially when it does come to those prize models that they put a lot of effort in and knowing like they did a lot to contribute to that, right? Beyond formatting and colors, right? Like the actual building and the modeling and whatnot. So that's awesome. Uh, Jamie, what were you going to say? No, I, I'm okay. I, I feel like we might have questions and everything. So I'll leave time. Sure. No problem. Um, well, in in keeping with time, um, why don't I wrap up the our panel just by asking all of you to um, perhaps share some advice for any uh, women who are kind of beginning their finance journey, right? Uh, either in the form of like, what could you tell them? Like, what do you wish you knew when you were in their shoes? And or like, what's just a valuable piece of advice that you'd really like to offer them as they're starting this process? Uh, Jamie, do you want to start? Yeah. Can I do two? I might. Oh, cheat. absolutely. <laughs> Just share as much knowledge as you would like. We, we are here for it. Uh, the first piece of advice is that all of these informational interviews should be considered two way. I think we all spend a lot of time really trying to impress the other person on the phone and less time necessarily feeling them out and feeling the culture out of some of these places. And again, at, at this point, and you guys are all fabulous students, you're at Georgetown, as they say. So I would really try and focus on like where you think that you fit because you're gonna have to spend a lot of time working wherever you are. And the low performer at the best bank is not going anywhere, but the high performer at what you'd say is the medium bank can do whatever they want because they have that reputation and those credentials. And my second piece of advice is to never leave it up to guessing, always be clear about what you want. There have been so, so many times where I've expressed what I want and the response has been, oh, wow, I wouldn't have guessed that. Or wow, I didn't even realize like, that I have the job I have now because I explicitly asked for it. And the worst that anyone else can say if you ask for something respectfully is no. And you know, you know that that's the answer and you can sort of move forward, but people know what your thoughts were and what you wanted. Um, because then it might also be up to them to provide further opportunities or so on and so forth. But never be afraid to just share what you want. Even if you're an intern and you want to work on a certain project, even if you don't get it, people know what you want and that you're really into what you're doing and that you have goals for yourself at that firm or in that role, et cetera. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Tiffany, do you want to go next? I agree with everything Jamie said. Um, some of the things that we look for, especially on the coverage side of banking when we're recruiting, is we want to see your enthusiasm. And then also, like she said, you know, someone who speaks up in your work, someone who goes the extra mile to like really understand the model, the assignment, the purpose of the meeting, like all of that, like we remember it. And that's like, it comes up in reviews. You want to see this person showed initiative that they really exceed expectations. So definitely, you know, as I say, like lean in and, you know, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, also, she made an excellent point about um, focusing on fit. I would say early on as an analyst, you know, you have to make a decision for yourself. You might try to just get your foot in the door and then explore later, or you want to pick the best fit right away. It's, it's an individual choice. Neither one is wrong. But you know, as they say, everyone knows this job is very demanding. It's very long hours. It's a lot of tedious work. And when they say attention to detail, trust me, it's beyond anything you can imagine right now. So you need to really like what you're doing, that be it a coverage or a product. You have to really enjoy the space, wherever that industry is. And you have to have a team that you like working with, like people that you don't mind working till 3 a.m. with. I have a VP in my group who doesn't have the best rep reputation, but I, I work well with him. For some reason, we understand each other. We work well together. And he is the only person 
that like I could have gone to bed at 11 and I stayed up till two to get something out to him just because I have a great working experience with him. I feel like I learn every time with him. I feel like he pushes me to do better. So on my own, I kind of like, I want to impress him and I want to make him and my team look good. So, you know, that just comes from having a good relationship with the people you work with, you know, and there's been times where, you know, sometimes you guys might explode at work or you might be a little snippy at work. And if you're in an environment where you guys can like address that and be cool, that's great. Or if you could be in an environment where it's like, hey, we're all under a lot of tension, it happens, keep it, keep it moving, great. Um, but yeah, I think you just need to know, you know your own work style, you know what type of environment you need because be it one year, three year or five years, however long, it will feel much longer if you're not in a good environment. One year can feel like 10 if you're not happy or one year is gonna go by very quickly. So those are the things you should take in consideration. Um, you know, again, what do you wanna get out of this experience and find the best place for that? Definitely, great point, Tiffany. Um, the airport test, right? Ultimately, if I were stuck, like if my plane was delayed and I was to be stuck in an airport with someone for a, just an indefinite amount of time, am I gonna enjoy their company or not? I, yeah, definitely, great point. Um, Catherine, do you wanna go next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, this is not only just what women, you know, overall phase, I would just say like, for me, I think the hardest part was, was actually kind of doing the recruiting process. And, um, and I don't know how it, I, I think, you know, maybe it could be potentially easier in this virtual environment. Um, I was just so intimidated as a woman during the on-campus recruiting events. Um, I just remember going to the whole, you know, bank panels and there were, you know, it was 70 or 80% men and they were really aggressive, super competitive. Um, and it was just kind of hard navigating, uh, you know, that room I was sweating. Um, you know, fortunately you, you can find, um, some great people at, at all of the banks and be able to have conversations with them, but you really, in some cases have to like physically, um, push your way through into some of the conversations. Um, and so I thought, you know, that, um, was maybe what the rest of, you know, uh, career in the industry was going to be like. Um, but it, it really wasn't, I think, um, once you kind of get in the door, um, it, it's, it's not as aggressive or male heavy. I think just at those recruiting events, it, it just can honestly intimidate you and you almost feel like, do I, do I belong here? Um, trust me, you do. Um, and once you get in the door at some of these banks, it is, it is not 70 or 80% men, even though if, if that might be what the recruiting, um, you know, auditorium may look like. Um, I'll also just say again, like using, um, an alumni network, really powerful. Um, I will just say, always come prepared with questions. You, um, should be talking equally as much as the individual you're talking to. Um, if you're asking for, you know, 15 or 30 minutes of their time, have a clear agenda of like, these are the three things I wanna ask you about. Um, also, a lot of the areas that we work in are not easy to Google, at least, you know, where I sit. If you were to Google the desk I'm on, I, I have no idea what would come up on Investopedia. Um, but do as best as you can and do some of that work and just say like, you know, I tried researching this. I've read a lot about that. I think I can understand this, but can you help explain this? I don't understand how this one piece fits into it. And then at least it's showing that you're putting some effort in and not just kind of asking us to give you all the answers. So that's another um, just piece of advice. Always, you know, come prepared um, to some of those, you know, informational calls uh, just so uh, it's, it's a two way. And then we'll actually remember you of like, oh, you know, that's the person that, asked me about this, or we talked about this one specific client that's been in the news. Um, you just have to be memorable. Absolutely. Wonderful points. Um, Brianna, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, what advice would you have to our um, blossoming sophomores about to embark on this journey? For sure. I mean, I think everyone has given really fantastic advice already, and I would echo so much of what's already been said. I think not to like beat a dead horse on some of the points that have been made, but I completely agree with the find your fit comment. Two of my best friends from Georgetown work in equity capital markets at two other firms. 
And it's so funny because we joke all the time that like we would be interchangeable. Like I could go work in either one of their desks and separate of some data providers, I would know exactly what my job was and how to do it. But our lives are so different from a cultural perspective. Our groups function so differently. Our groups have such different cultures and we all individually really like our firms, but we found that fit. And so you really have to just talk to people and have those genuine conversations to get there. Um, and then sort of similar to what Catherine was saying about being so intimidated at recruiting events and you know, wondering what it would actually be like after such a crazy recruiting process, which it is, I think I wish I had known that it wasn't so scary in the sense that I remember the day before my first day on the desk sophomore year, I was like, what if tomorrow I just get dropped into the deep end and they ask me to do a hundred things that I have no idea how to do. And it's like the worst experience of my life. And it could not have been farther from what happened. I think people are so willing to teach you people literally from like step zero to step, you know, a hundred, they're there to take you by the hand and make sure that you are getting all the foundational aspects of what you need to succeed. So don't go in terrified, um, go in excited to learn and go in, you know, expecting to just like be a sponge and take in everything that people throw at you, but it's not going to be, you know, you get dropped into like die, sink or swim. It's not at all like that. Super great point as well, Brianna. And yeah, to what Catherine and both of you have said, um, I mean, even as an advisor, when I walk into the, oh gosh, when networking and recruiting was in person for the portion of last year, right before things hit the fan. Yeah. You're just surrounded by like a sea of suits, you know, and especially if you're new to this and whatnot, it can definitely be super intimidating. So i um, so glad that you guys are able to shed light and just, you know, talk about your experiences. Cause I do think that hopefully helps students that are watching today, you know, just breathe a little bit easier knowing there's very relatable people on the other end of these calls that they'll be having that want to get to know them as much as they want to get to know you all. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone. So uh, for all of our students that are watching, one, I hope you took notes. Uh, I'm your advisor and I've been taking notes on sticky notes. So hopefully you've been doing so as well. It's been very, very helpful and very enlightening. Um, I'm going to open up the uh, open up the space for questions. So if you would like to, you could raise your hand and like verbally ask a question, or you can feel free to drop, drop some questions in the chat and we can definitely answer them in that way as well. So uh, please definitely ask some questions. We have wonderful alum that are happy to answer. Um, great, so Christine says, thank you all for being here tonight. I was wondering what were the best strategies you found to adapt to the steep finance learning curve? Ooh, I'll start with that one um, because some people actually made fun of me for doing all this pre-work that I created for myself before I started full-time in, intern, uh, in interning, but I spoke to a lot of analysts that not only were in my role, but were in investment banking broadly, and I just asked them a bunch of random facts that they need to know throughout the day, and I made myself many assignments. So, for example, to know, uh, like, the companies that are in the Dow, like, do you use the Dow or the S&P to like record the 10 year treasury every Friday and just like kind of track that stuff. And it seems kind of silly because I just made it in my own Google doc. But when you show up to work, people are talking about what's happened while you're in school. And if you're not really focusing on the market then or trends, then you're going to be a little confused about what they're talking about day one. And then the second piece of advice is Tiffany was talking about how we work really long hours. There are going to be some days where maybe you could be done at eight or nine and you just want to go home, but you're trying to figure something out. Take the time and just like find out the best resource for everything, the best person to call for everything, have contacts in different teams. Because when you're the person who knows how to get everything done, you might not be the smartest, but you know how to get it done. And that's more important, honestly, in taking that time. Uh, if you have a Bloomberg terminal, know how to use it, use fact set, like where can you find everything, but knowing more than somebody else and being indisposable in that sense is super important because that's how you learn for sure.
I would say definitely do the pre-work. Um, even me, I, I came in as an MBA recruit. So like I already studied finance at Georgetown and then I actually worked in finance and then I still did some pre-work before I started my internship. Um, so like we both undergrad and graduate school, we all had trained the street. There's a bunch of online resources if you want to um, actually try to do some modeling. I think Wall Street Oasis and um, Maccabis.com um, I think they have some templates. So, you know, you can try your hand at LBOs and actual merger models, but, you know, it's great to practice and learn on your own. And then you can work, uh, get real world hands-on experience as well. Sorry, just taking notes of all the wonderful technologies and resources you all are um, laying out to be put in a future newsletter. Um, wonderful. Does anyone else in the audience have any additional questions they would like to ask? Don't be shy. <laughs> um, and then quick question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jamie. I saw you unmuted. Sorry. <laughs> no, don't be, don't be. Go, please go ahead. I was going to give an unsolicited piece of advice that I wish I knew when I was a sophomore. Part of it is like these jobs, this like first job out of Georgetown, like isn't going to be your last job. It's not the end all be all. And I think that you should focus on, you might have this long-term goal and you're just so certain of it, but you could also just be a little unsure. And I think you should just focus on like your nearest term goals and like what's going to enable you to get to that next step or what's going to help you at least build the skills to get you to where you want to be. And so taking all of this advice, like you don't have to say, I want to die hard, be an analyst at JP Morgan for the rest of my life, which you shouldn't be, you should get promoted. But just thinking about that and not putting all of this pressure on yourself to figure everything out when you're what, 20, 20 years old. I'll um, also add a piece of advice um, and just something that we look for when we're recruiting um, and each bank is a little different, has some different culture. Um, this obviously is a very competitive industry, um, but I will also say, you know, there, there's a lot of collaboration and teamwork that is very much involved. Um, and they're like, at least for us, when we're recruiting, like we obviously need someone that has this competitive spirit in their approach to work. Um, but you know, the way we view clients is holistically as a firm, it's all about teamwork cross divisional. Um, and I think in the recruiting process, you know, when we were recruiting on campus, if someone is only the one asking questions when there's a whole group, that's not going to look good on them. Um, someone that has tag teamed and, you know, decided to recruit along one of their friends and they're saying, you know, we just, partnered together and it's easier to jump into conversations together and they felt more comfortable. That is showing that, yeah, yes, we're technically competing for a same job that we're applying to, but that's okay. So I, I think um, there's, you know, a level of competitiveness, but also a level of you need to look like a team player. That's really important. Um, at least something that we look for when we're recruiting. Uh, Julia, you're on mute. Ah, so sorry about that. Oh, thought I could get away in a webinar without having that happen. Uh, I guess not. Uh, so uh, Sydney has asked, uh, or Sydney says, thank you all for being here. Finance is obviously a very broad industry. So how did you choose capital markets or investment banking specifically? Uh, Jamie has a wonderful, excellent point about cultures being different and it's dependent on like personality skills that you want to develop and whatnot. Um, and alluding to, right, like having those networking calls is going to help expose you to like what the different divisions look like, but also maybe you learning more about yourself, right? Like when uh, Tiffany mentioned earlier, like some people kind of talk them, those, themselves out of finance or perhaps a specific division into something else. And I was wondering if anyone else had any additional thoughts about, you know, choosing a division or trying to figure that out when they're networking and or recruiting.
I can chat about this. So I actually had the really unique opportunity as a sophomore to rotate through sales and trading, banking, and capital markets. Um, that's just the nature of city sophomore program. And I really learned a lot about my working style, having been in the three of them. They're so different. Um, they really, they definitely do appeal to a number of different people. I think for myself, I always viewed sales and trading and investment banking as two like opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of personalities and kind of work that you did. Um, and I really liked the energy of the sales and trading experience that I had. I thought it was so energizing. I loved the kind of social aspect and how fast paced it was. But when I was in sales and trading, I realized that I really missed um, PowerPoint, which sounds so stupid saying out loud, but I really liked having physical deliverables that I could point to and I could say, I made this to answer your question. And there are probably desks in sales and trading that do that kind of work. Um, but I was on a structured credit trading desk that was very execution focused. And then on the other kind of end of the spectrum, when I was in banking, um, I had it kind of after I'd been in capital markets and everyone was like, you're going to the library next. Like you have no idea what's, what's waiting for you up there. I was kind of like, I don't know what you mean. And then on my first day, I realized that I hadn't really talked to anyone in like multiple hours. And I was like, I really miss the social engagement um, that you get in capital markets. And, and so capital markets for me felt like a mixture of the things that I liked both about both of them sort of still a loud, fast paced floor with people shouting and talking over each other and wanting to engage all the time. But at the same time, a lot of the work and sort of physical deliverables of investment banking. So that was kind of how I ended up in capital markets. Um, one thing I usually use to describe the two for students is choosing between capital markets, those products and coverage is um, you either be one to many or many to one. So for me on the coverage side, I specialize in one particular industry, but I advise on all types of transactions. It could be M&A, IPO, debt uh, raises, restructuring. So one industry, but focusing on all types of transactions, or you can be on the um, product side where you focus on one particular thing, but it could be across industry. So you kind of like you specialize in IPOs or you specialize in, in debt, um, your know, preferred sub debt, senior notes, um, but you can do it across industries. So it's again, whatever your style is, um, you know, and what you want to focus on. If you want, it's kind of like, do you want to be an expert on a type of transaction or you want to be an expert on a type of industry? Great, thanks everyone. Um, just being cognizant of time and wanting to honor the schedules of all of our panelists, I'll read this last question from Nicole. So thank you all for being here. I was wondering if you could shed some light on how to try and avoid the overwhelming feelings that come with recruiting. Very understandable, Nicole, great question. I'm happy to start with that. My personality, if I'm if I have, I guess, my goals for a conversation or goals for an event ahead of time, it always helps me like de-stress because I just know what I want to get out of it instead of getting carried away with the various conversations that can take place at a recruiting event. So perhaps if you're going to a capital markets event and your goal is to figure out why capital markets versus IB, you can at least stay focused on trying to facilitate that conversation instead of being overwhelmed into the different directions that you can get pulled into. Or perhaps if you say, okay, I want to speak to an analyst, a VP, and an MD to get a variety of perspectives, knowing that you kind of know what you have left to achieve in the virtual or in-person event. I always felt like that really helped me. There were times where there's too many people and I just left. And but I sort of wrote down people's names and followed up later. So just knowing what you want to get out of an event first so that you can focus on that instead of perhaps what Brianna or Catherine or Tiffany would want out of the event themselves. Cool, wonderful point, Jamie. Um, and yeah, I think hopefully 
Nicole um, and for all of the other students listening in. I think the other part of it that uh, I've heard many people tell me, like people that have gone through the process is like run your own race, right? Like you are probably going to be surrounded by peers who are also interested in finance because it's very popular at Georgetown. Um, but the important thing is understanding like for you, one, what do you have capacity to do, right? Because you're a Georgetown student and we all know that is not easy on top of like recruiting, which in and of itself could be like a full-time class, right? And so hopefully you can also set boundaries for yourself in terms of what are you capable of doing without getting burnt out um, and still allowing this to be a learning and an enjoyable process, um, but also knowing like if you have to dedicate other parts of your time to like self-care, to academics, to family, to whatever else, knowing that that's okay too. Um, I know as your advisor saying this is very much like easier said than done, but like I do, I don't know, I just want to encourage you all um, and definitely you too, Nicole, that um, like it is a race for yourself. Like it will only make it harder if you look to your left and right and compare yourself to what other people are doing, like set goals, but also set realistic expectations for what you know you're capable of doing and how much you can handle. Um, so I think with that, we will call it a night because I don't want to take up more of our panelists time, but thank you all so, so very much for joining us. Um, we are so lucky to have you all as a lot.